tunnels seem to accrue more folklore than most other underground spaces. Perhaps it's because we can't see where they go when we can only see the entrance. Or perhaps we've been so primed by fiction to believe tunnels must lead somewhere that we love the idea of a secret world beneath our feet. Some tunnel legends are common and appear all over the British Isles, with people attempting to explore them and vanishing during the effort. Others are mere rumours snaking beneath city centres to connect churches with other buildings. But is there any truth to these stories, and why do we seem so attracted to legends of tunnels? Well, let's examine some examples of these stories to see how they work in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there, and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult, and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author, and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. How are you? And I do mean that. How are you doing? Are you enjoying November? I must admit, I'm quite enjoying the fact that it actually feels like November now, but I'm not necessarily enjoying all the Christmas stuff that's everywhere. Although, and I will make this my last introduction thing before I crack on with the episode, I did get the best Christmas decoration pretty much ever because I was at Newcastle Cathedral and I ended up buying a Christmas ornament, which is essentially like a woodcut bauble with laser cut type things on it. And it's of the vampire rabbit. And we all know how much I love the vampire rabbit of old Newcastle. So that is going to be hanging on my Christmas cactus this year because essentially, and I won't bore you with the details, but we haven't actually got the space to put the proper Christmas tree up now ever since I brought my three cacti home from work. So I now just decorate them instead. But yeah, so I have a vampire rabbit decoration for my tree or cactus which I'm very excited about but I won't be decorating it until December because obviously that's when Christmas is. Anyway we're going to continue with this month's theme of subterranean folklore and obviously so far we've looked at smugglers caves in the northeast and last week we did catacombs and apparently Aaron from the Appalachian Folklore Podcast loves the way I pronounce catacombs. I'm pretty sure some people pronounce it catacombs but that just doesn't seem right to me so I thought I'll just pronounce it the way I always have. So this week we're doing tunnels, mostly because I wanted to cover the first story that we're going to look at, which is one of my favourite legends. But it's also because tunnels have that weird sort of vibe to them where, because we don't always necessarily know if there are tunnels down there, if there are tunnels, where do they go? And obviously, bear in mind, I used to live in London, and when you look at all the stuff that's under the city, it's like the idea of having a secret network of tunnels wouldn't be at all surprising. So... We are going to start off with the Royal Mile Tunnel, which is one of my favourite Edinburgh legends. And as you might imagine, it involves a tunnel. Now, according to the legend, this tunnel ran beneath the Royal Mile. So if you're not familiar with Edinburgh, that connects Edinburgh Castle on the rock all the way down to Holyrood Palace at the bottom. And many centuries ago, builders working on Edinburgh Castle's defences found a tunnel where they didn't expect to find one. It cut down into Castle Rock with unnaturally smooth sides, and some of the other builders thought that it might have actually been the work of fairies. Because of that, they wanted to cover it back up again. Now, one of the castle's pipers came over to see what was going on, and he spotted the tunnel. He ignored the workers' warnings and then headed down into his tunnel with his pipes, and the workmen could follow the sound of his bagpipes down the Royal Mile, but then the music abruptly stopped at the spot where you now find the Tron Kirk. Now, they thought that the piper must have hit a dead end, perhaps that was where the tunnel ran out, and they waited at the tunnel's entrance for him, expecting him to simply retrace his route back up to the castle again. When he didn't reappear, they panicked and bricked up the entrance, convinced that some evil must have befallen him. And according to the legend, you can still hear the bagpipes on quiet nights, tracing the route beneath the Royal Mile until they stop beside the Tron. Now, on one of the ghost walks I've enjoyed in Edinburgh, The guide actually retold the story but replaced the adult piper with a young drummer boy and it somehow seemed much more sad thinking of a child stuck in a mysterious tunnel. And with this story, it is essentially a variation on a really popular legend that you actually find all over the British Isles. Now, I don't know which one came first. I wouldn't be a bit surprised actually if the Edinburgh one came first and then other people adapted it. But the other variations usually see a fiddler replacing the piper. 
So in one version from Wrexham, the myth claimed that either a cave, a mine or a catacomb started near the entrance to Chirk Castle. And one legend said that if you found yourself within five paces of the entrance, you'd end up drawn inside and then you'd be lost forever. Now, one fiddler wanted to bust the myth and he headed into the tunnel one Halloween, which obviously, if you're any kind of believer in folklore, you know, is probably a little bit of a silly idea. But he wanted to walk the tunnels while playing the fiddle again so people outside could hear where he was. And I love the way that they use these musical instruments as a way of letting people know where they are. Problem was, the fiddler was never seen again. There's a similar story from Little Dean in Gloucestershire. And a tunnel apparently ran between a house named Old Grange to Flaxley Abbey, which is around a mile away. Now, this tunnel is quite interesting in that part of it did exist and children would apparently dare each other to go inside. And rumours abounded that either monks or royalists had made the tunnel. Now, there's also a small wood between Flaxley and Little Dean known as Fiddler's Cops. And as with the other stories, a fiddler apparently entered the tunnel and walked along it, playing his fiddle so his friends could follow his progress above ground. Near the wood, the music stopped abruptly and no one saw him again, hence the reason why the wood is then called Fiddler's Cops. And you can also find a similar story in West Malling in Kent, where again, the wood is still called Fiddler's Cops. Now, part of it always ends up making me think of Fiddler's Green from The Sandman, and I've no idea if that was what Neil Gaiman had in mind when he named the character. But... I think it is quite interesting that in all of these stories you have this idea of somebody with some means of making sound goes into a tunnel to see where it goes and is then never heard of again because of the fact that the sound abruptly stops. The fact that nobody ever goes in to check that nothing's happened to them is always a little bit sort of suspicious for me because you think perhaps they've fallen down into a lower level of tunnel or something like that. So yeah, it does always bother me slightly how easily these poor people get abandoned by their supposed friends. But it is a really common story type that you do get around the country. And as I say, don't know which one came first. I'll probably hazard a guess maybe the Edinburgh one because it's such a well-known legend. And I think they've obviously then, there's the extra spin of using the bagpipes, which would make more sense given it's Edinburgh Castle. I've never heard the bagpipes under the Royal Mile, but then because of all the traffic noise and whatnot now, it's a little bit more difficult to tell. But as I say, that's one particular type of famous British tunnel story. And the other one that's really common is the secret tunnel network. And they're nearly always connected with a town centre church running beneath buildings in a busy part of the town. The Bedfordshire town of Leighton Buzzard is one such town and it apparently stands atop such a network of tunnels if you believe the folklore. Now, according to the legend, they link the cellar of All Saints Church with various buildings on the High Street. Some people think they might have been priest halls built during times of Catholic persecution. And for anyone listening who's not really come across priest halls before, essentially during the Tudors, when you had that flip-flop back and forward between a Catholic person on the throne then persecuting Protestants and then a Protestant royal persecuting Catholics, priest halls were essentially put in place so that Catholic families had somewhere to hide a priest should Protestants turn up to raid the house. So the idea is these Tunnels then acted like priest holes, but as escape routes to allow priests to actually escape the property as well. Now, other people actually suggest the tunnels might have been used by smugglers, although Josh Bolton actually notes that that's really unlikely because Leighton Buzzard is too far from the coast. Bearing in mind, smugglers obviously did have to get the product into the interior of the country away from the coast. I don't think you can immediately write off the idea of smugglers using tunnels to get goods around a town centre. But at the same time, you think that's also going to be really quite a heavy duty thing to do to actually build tunnels under a town that nobody would hear you doing it. Nobody would even see you doing it. So I do think it's something that we have to bear in mind, but we will come back to the likelihood of these being true towards the end of the episode. And obviously, if there were different versions of the Piper or Fiddler story, there are different versions of this story. And according to local legend, Wrexham Town Centre apparently boasts hidden tunnels below. And they're believed to begin under Wrexham Parish Church and then run beneath the town centre. Now, in some cases, tales of secret tunnels do make sense. Those connected with castles, and we are going to have a look at one, are certainly plausible, either to provide supplies in times of siege or to allow for an escape should one be necessary. Now, the tunnels linked with large houses, like I said before, are often considered to be an extension of the priest hall. 
but I should also point out on a slightly more salacious note that some monasteries were believed to have secret tunnels leading to nearby nunneries, and you can guess why. But the town centre tunnels don't always make sense, because depending on the location, smugglers might build them, but like I said before, how do they do this without alerting anyone to what they were doing? Now, even in my own hometown of Newcastle-upon-Tyne, I've long heard stories of a tunnel connecting the old Burgoyne's pub with St Andrew's Church. Now, as far as I've been told, this particular tunnel allegedly let people escape to the church where they could then claim sanctuary from the law if they committed a crime. So, obviously, if you got into some kind of bar fight, accidentally killed someone, you could then follow this passageway from the pub to St Andrew's Church and then, essentially, nobody could touch you while you were there. Now, what would happen if you happened to kill someone in a pub that wasn't Burgoyne's? I'm not really sure, but this is how the story goes. And Burgoyne's no longer exists, and the extension of the Eldon Square shopping mall now stands on the site. So even if there was a tunnel, I doubt it leads anywhere now. But it does lend a slightly different aspect, I think, to a lot of these town centre stories, because of the fact that you often see people saying that the tunnel starts at the church, but how do we know that we've not got that backwards and the tunnel might actually end at the church and again it might simply be to provide some sort of secret getaway in the need of sanctuary needing to be sought. I don't know. But Jennifer Westwood and Jacqueline Simpson note the commonality of these stories and in some variations part of what looks like a tunnel still remains. That's what fires everyone's imagination up that oh there might be a tunnel there. But unfortunately, it often turns out to be something very unglamorous like a sewer or part of an ice house. But still, the imagination is a wonderful thing. And in one of the sources I was reading, there was this suggestion that in the days before people really understood what an ice house had been used for, it's entirely possible that someone may have stumbled across the entrance to one and thought, ooh, that looks like it must lead somewhere and assumed it was the start of a tunnel when it wasn't, it was actually an ice house. So again, that's a possibility. But like I said before, some castles do have tunnels and it's understandable why they would do. And in the case of Dover Castle, it has rather a lot of tunnels. And if you do get the chance to visit Dover Castle, I would highly recommend it because it's really interesting. And the tunnels themselves, because there's like two different types, you've got the Napoleonic ones and you've got the wartime ones. It's just quite interesting to sort of see how they all fit together and so on. Slightly side note, the same architect designed both Dover Castle and Newcastle's Castle Keep and it's really interesting that you get some of the same design features across both of them but highly recommend it for a day out if you're in the area. But we're talking about tunnels. So according to legend, there was a drummer boy who actually met a murderous end in the 18th century tunnels during the Napoleonic Wars, although he now patrols the battlements as a headless spectre. If you hear his drumming, it apparently foretells war. And if you ever saw the special episode of Most Haunted that they actually did live, I think it was, from Dover Castle, I think Derek Akora claimed he could see someone marching around behind a vet on the battlements. So whether that was our headless drummer boy or not, I can't remember. But he's one of the more famous phantoms of Dover Castle. And people have actually claimed to see ghosts in World War II garb in the wartime tunnels. Now, other people have actually heard screaming and cries, down in the wartime tunnels and this is actually hardly surprising since those from the Dunkirk landings were actually brought here so they are sort of spaces associated with for example wartime but also the aftermath of war as well so people have heard all kinds of sounds like a battle's actually raging and things like that so either the tunnels have potentially soaked up the atmosphere from this or it's just very evocative for people of what it must have been like at the time. That being said, according to property steward Gavin Wright, one man on a tour of the wartime tunnels suddenly fell to the ground. When he got up, he explained that he was fine, but he didn't appreciate the man walking through him. So, again, if you do go in the wartime tunnels, keep your eyes peeled. And again, elsewhere, some tunnels clearly do exist. And obviously, there's the tunnels of transportation networks, and there's already the episode about the legends associated with the London Underground. And I know that obviously where the Underground's concerned, most of the stories are about the trains or the platforms, because they're the bits that the public can access. But there's long been loads of urban legends about like people living in the tunnels and things like that. So things like that, where we know that the tunnels exist because we actually travel through them, do have a slightly different kind of urban legend associated with them. But one of the tunnels I want to have a look at is Box Tunnel in Wiltshire, and it's actually a mass more folklore than most. 
Now, it was built by Isambard Kingdom Brunel, and a popular legend claims that Brunel built it on a particular alignment so that the rising sun would shine through it on his birthday, which is April the 9th. And Great Western Railways actually tested the theory on April the 9th, 2017. Now, the sun did shine into the tunnel, but not all the way through, although, as one person pointed out, considering the sun is in a slightly different position on the same date from year to year, it is possibly true. And there's another urban legend in which the UK government hid a whole fleet of steam locomotives during the Cold War called the UK Strategic Steam Reserve. And the idea was that they would be able to transport supplies around the country in the event of a nuclear attack. And some think that the government actually hid the reserve in Box Tunnel, although there is actually no evidence that the reserve ever existed in the first place. And elsewhere, people believe that the UK government set up an underground bunker during the Cold War to act as HQ if London became unviable. And the so-called last train would leave London Paddington and head to Box Tunnel in the wake of a nuclear attack. While there was a government bunker to the south of Box Tunnel, the second tunnel in the area which was believed to be home to the hidden train station for the last train actually lay to the north, which would have actually made moving between the two really quite tricky, so it's highly unlikely that that was actually the case. But naturally, Box Tunnel also boasts its own ghost, and four men were working inside the tunnel at the eastern end in 2011. They heard the sounds of a woman moaning at the mouth of the tunnel. One of the men shone his torch up the hill and they spotted a woman looking down at them. She wore a nightdress and actually disappeared as they looked up at her. She had actually been seen previously by a group of six men, but no one actually knew who she is or indeed who she was. If you are interested in such railway folklore, then I do actually have a whole bonus episode about railway legends available to Patreon supporters at the £3.50 a month or more tier. There's a whole bunch full of things like that on Patreon. So ultimately, what do we make of this folklore of tunnels? Well, the problem with some of these tunnels is we don't know if they existed or not. And without evidence, one way or the other, it is quite tempting to assume that there must be some truth to the rumours, that age-old no smoke without fire kind of approach. But we do need to bear some practicalities in mind, and the Brown Hills Bob blog actually makes an excellent point about the likelihood of secret tunnels, because the tunnels aren't actually particularly easy to build, they would be expensive to build, and depending on when they were built, the technology might not even have been up to it. So from a rational, financial and practical point of view, it's unlikely that the tunnels exist where there is no evidence for them. Of course, we do have the tunnels such as Dover Castle's tunnels or the Box Tunnel. Obviously, the question here is not whether the tunnels exist, because we know that they did, but we're more bothered about what actually happened in them. And it's perhaps unsurprising that legends and conspiracies combine to add flavour to the history of these spaces. And I think part of the problem that we then have with spaces like this is it's quite easy for conspiracies to fill a gap around something. So Dover Castle is slightly different because the, the stories related to the tunnels there are pretty much straightforward ghost stories. And you get those with castles all over the country, indeed all over the world. So they're just located in the tunnels for various reasons. But when you look at the box tunnel stories and how they kind of veer off into conspiracy, I think part of that is because... It is a slightly unusual tunnel, so therefore, because it's not something that we're sort of expecting or whatever, it's easier for stories to then fill that gap. And unfortunately, if you repeat them often enough, people then start to believe that they must be true or at least have a grain of truth to them, which is indeed unfortunate. And of course, I can't really end this particular episode without mentioning perhaps the finest piece of fiction ever written that involves a a tunnel and that would be Charles Dickens The Signalman and if you've never read it I highly recommend that you seek it out online it is really really good there is a 1970s adaptation starring Denham Elliott as well which is also very very good and will no doubt be on at Christmas because it usually is and it was actually inspired by a true disaster in a railway tunnel so in some cases truth itself does actually inspire some legends although sometimes they then go on to become fiction but if you have any of your own examples of the folklore of tunnels please do let me know if your hometown has legends of tunnels beneath the town which no one's perhaps ever proven again please let me know because I am fascinated by how many just ordinary towns around the country apparently have these secret secret networks of tunnels and so on which I dare say would probably be quite useful if you were just trying to actually deliver supplies rather than trying to drive massive lorries up these really tiny 
winding cobbled streets and so on, but that's a side issue. So do feel free to let me know if you've got any favourite examples of folklore of tunnels. Got a couple of little announcements at the end, that's why I remember. Obviously people are talking at the moment about the supposed implosion of Twitter that's apparently imminent. You can always still find me on Facebook, the link is in the show notes below. You can find me on Instagram, the link is in the show notes below. If you desperately want to stay connected, then by all means sign up for my home protection guide using folklore. Obviously, as always, disclaimer, please make sure that you still have things like burglar alarms and stuff as well. But if you sign up for my email list, you will then get emails like from my email address, so you can always communicate with me that way. And I am on Mastodon as well, which I'm slowly getting the hang of, so I've put that link in the show notes as well. If you're on YouTube, obviously you can just simply drop a comment at this video and you can always chat with us there. And again, you can always post a comment in the comment section on the blog. And again, the link is below. So I always make sure that I put links for different ways to get in touch if you want to tell me any stories, if you want to pass on any legends that you know, things like that. There are various different places where you can do so. If you do have legends, though, it is quite good to post them on YouTube or the comment section of my blog because then other people can see them and we can kind of collect folklore and so on together. The second announcement, uh, and it sounds like I've got something dreadful to say and I don't, it's just I'm doing another talk with Cresswell Crags. So this one is going to be on weather folklore because it's going to be in December. So it's going to be at 6pm GMT, which I think if I remember correctly is 1pm on the Eastern Seaboard of America and I think 10 a.m. on the West Coast, if I remember correctly. And it'll be like 7 p.m. in Europe. So that's going to be on the 12th of December. As always, I think it's the tickets are free, but you can give a donation to Cresswell Crags, obviously to help them with the upkeep of this fabulous ancient historical site in the UK. And yes, it was weather folklore. So you're more than welcome to come along and have a look. There probably will be a replay, but Cresswell Crags tend to put them on their Patreon for their obviously paying supporters so if you do need a replay then you'll need to double check that with them i don't have any control over stuff like that at my end and there may also be the possibility of me doing a live event actually in newcastle later on december but i'm still trying to iron out the details for that one so hopefully next week i'll have a little bit more information for you on that one speaking of next week we're going to be having a look at the folklore of caves. Now, I won't be covering Wookie Hole because we've done Wookie Hole before, but I'm going to have a look at some folklore of other caves and whatnot around the country as well. So while we did do smugglers caves, these are going to be just more general caves, which still have some pretty cool things associated with them as well. So without any further ado, I will see you next week, and I hope that you have a marvellous week ahead. Cheerio! Well, thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts, because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record, and edit these episodes, so if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee. Or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles, and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below, and thanks in advance.